Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Ann Harrison. I'm the Dean at the Haas School of Business. Welcome on this beautiful sunny day. Um, this is a very special Dean Speaker Series. It is co-sponsored by the Haas Veterans Club. I am deeply honored to introduce General Stanley McChrystal, who is today's distinguished speaker. General McChrystal was educated at West Point, the US Naval War College, and Harvard's John F. Kennedy School of Government. He has practiced and established effective leadership throughout his Army career, which has included numerous leadership and staff positions. Most notably, from 2003 to 2008, General McChrystal commanded the Joint Special Operations Command with responsibility for leading the nation's deployed military counterterrorism efforts around the globe. In 2009, he received his fourth star and assumed command of all international forces in Afghanistan. In 2011, General McChrystal founded the McChrystal Group, an advisory services firm that encourages businesses to challenge the hierarchical command and control approach to organizational management. A passionate advocate for national service, McChrystal is the chair of the Board of Service Year Alliance, which envisions a future in which a service year is a cultural expectation for every young American. He's also a senior fellow at Yale University's Jackson Institute for Global Affairs, where he teaches a popular course on leadership and is a best-selling author of a number of leadership books. General McChrystal, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. We are so grateful you are here and we are really looking forward to today's discussion. Today's conversation will be led by two MBA students, both veterans, and part of our Haas Veterans Club. We will have time for audience questions after the conversation. So Nate, go ahead and let's get started. Uh, hi, General. <clears throat> uh, my name is Nate Mason. I uh, enlisted in the Air Force, uh, inspired by the attacks of 9-11, um, and actually ended up serving 12 years on active duty before separating. Thanks for being here. Uh, Thanks my, for having me. It's an honor. My first question, sir, is uh, when you were a young officer, you were taught to trust your gut to go with your instincts, but later you said that mindset was wrong. At Haas, we're taught to make data-driven data decisions. I believe decision-making takes a balanced approach of trusting your gut and using data. Uh, do you still believe trusting your gut is wrong? And if not, like what changed your mind? Yeah, I, I don't think there's a single answer to this because the answer is if you have enough data, theoretically, you have the answer to the problem. But we almost never have enough data. And if we have a lot of data, we don't know if we have all the data that we need. And so the answer is, I think it's always a combination. What I would say is the best approach that I find is first to be voracious about trying to get information that informs you about the problem or the decision you're going to make. But don't be scared to make a decision with your instincts either. Often you know so much more than you think you do. And there's also one of the biggest challenges I've seen is people will try to get more and more information to mitigate the risk that they're wrong down to zero. And by the time you've gathered that much information, the opportunity's passed or the risk is arrived. So the reality is it's always a balance and you are gonna have to, unless things change dramatically, go an awful lot with your instincts, often more than you really would like to. Thank you. Uh, recently, I had a class with Angela Duckworth, an American author and researcher who's best known for her research on grit, um, a strength she defines as passion and perseverance for long-term goals. Uh, her research found a positive correlation between grit and highly successful people. Uh, what would it be uh, if you had to name one characteristic of your most successful leaders? Yeah, this is an interesting one because we can sort of hang it on the word successful. Um, if somebody is an effective leader, it doesn't mean they're a good person. 
It also doesn't, because if we say successful, I mean, in that mind, Adolf Hitler was successful to, by many uh, metrics, and there are a number of other people that we don't admire, their efforts or the outcome, but they were effective at what they did, and therefore you could argue successful. But what I would say, I think the most important thing, without trying to dance around that, is I agree with the idea of grit in generally successful in accomplishing what you want to do. I think empathy is critical for leaders. And when I say empathy, I don't mean sympathy. I don't mean rubbing people's back and making them feel good. What I mean is the ability to put yourself in a position where you can respect what the other person's perspective is. Be able to put yourself on the other side of the table and understand that the people you're dealing with or leading are probably and usually are rational people. They have a view, they have a mindset that is a result of their life experience to that point. And so sometimes we think that if I speak louder or if I have a very clever argument, I'm gonna talk people into a different perspective on life. And I found that that's typically not the outcome. Typically, if you are empathetic enough to respect people's viewpoints, then you have an ability, a starting point to start and connect to them. And in many cases, provide the kind of leadership that, that is effective. Uh, General, uh, in your book, Team of Teams, um, you describe a, a gardener analogy to leadership. Um, can you briefly describe that uh, approach to the, to the group? And then uh, the second part, uh, how can leaders create and foster that type of environment? Yeah, I'm happy to. And I really came up with that gardener analogy from working in my mother's garden when I was a kid, where I was sort of unskilled labor carrying stuff around. But the reality is, for much of the leadership training that I got, it was really sort of based on the idea of being a chess master. And it was designed to build as much competence as you could at the military art in the case of uh, military leadership, and in uh, the ability to be a strategist. And that crosses beyond just military. But the idea is, if you are a brilliant strategist, you maneuver your organization like chess pieces on a board. And if you're better than your opponent, then your organization will be more successful than theirs. You'll win the battle or the business interaction. What I found in the later parts of my career as I got into increasingly complex environments, and I think this is more and more true in the modern age is variables and the speed of things increase, therefore the complexity of the environment that we're operating in increases. What I found is that doesn't really work because I haven't run into anybody that's good enough to do that in that kind of environment. Even though we have this sirens call of modern technology where I can talk to anybody with a cell phone, connect with them, I can see where they are using unmanned aerial vehicles or tracking systems. So if I wanna micromanage, I've got more tools than any time in history. But I would argue that this is exactly the time we need to take the opposite approach because in a complex environment, what I have found works best is to take this gardener approach. And that is really the gardener creates the garden. The gardener doesn't grow anything, only plants do that. But the gardener creates an environment where plants do that which only plants can do. And so the idea of the gardener is somewhat less ego-driven, somewhat less leader-centric, but the gardener creates this opportunity for the people in this case, in the organization, to do more, to be more effective themselves. Instead of being chess pieces, in fact, they are thinking, acting, decision-making entities. And what I found in a very complex environment, that is far more effective. And it's also has second and third order effects of helping develop people over time. Will you have some misstep, missteps? Will you have some junior leaders who don't yet have the experience or the competence to get it right all the time, you will. But the reality is, I believe that in the aggregate, you have fewer mistakes and a much better outcome when you push that down to people lower in the organization, closer to the problem. Uh, one of the team of teams framework is trust. Uh, with more and more companies allowing employees to work remotely, uh, how can you effectively build trust across organizations in the remote setting? I'm not sure we know yet, to be honest. 
I think we have a lot of theories about it. And we say we're going to trust you. Uh, and in trust goes both ways. It's the organization trust up into the organization to the values of the organization, to their leaders, to their fellow uh, teammates. But in my experience, much of trust comes from a lot of interaction. You know, I often jokingly ask people, who do they or what do they trust? And they say, well, I trust my family or my pastor or my best friends. And I typically go, you trust McDonald's. And they go, no, I don't. You know, I don't like that food. And I say, you do trust it because when you see the sign on the roadway, you know what to expect. They have, through repeated interactions, convinced you that you know about how good the quality will be, about how clean it will be, exactly what it will cost. And therefore, you can make a decision based upon a level of trust, and, and you go or don't go there. And so I think in organizations where we are remote, we are going to have to take a journey here and figure out what really builds that trust. What gives us enough interactions where I, for example, would trust your good intentions and your competence? Because if you say you're going to do something, I've got to trust both of those. One, I think you're going to do it for you know, my best outcome, but also that you're capable of delivering what you say. And so I think it's going to take us a little while. And it'll, it'll vary for different organizations and people. But I think it's a journey that's really just starting. Uh, in your book, Leaders, um, you debunk what you call the attribution myth, um, which purports that uh, successes and failures of a team are all the results of its leader, uh, which I know is really big in the Army. Uh, instead, you suggest that the best leaders, like you mentioned a little bit earlier, are those who are able to maximize their team members' potential without putting themselves on a pedestal. Here at Haas, we have a lot of people who will soon be in situations where they'll want to make a lot of impact. Um, how, what would you recommend to them uh, to, to attempt to make that impact without putting themselves on a pedestal or trying to do too much? Yeah, it's a really interesting tension because it pulls in several directions, not just two. Uh, first off, when I left the military, along with a, a great young man who's just graduating from Yale Law School, I wrote my memoirs. And it was a humbling experience because you write your memoirs you know what happened because you were there. Well, the reality is we spent two and a half years researching all the parts of my life that, that were interesting enough to include in memoirs, or at least I thought they were. And what we found in, when we did all these interviews is in many cases, I had a pretty superficial view of what had happened at a case. We had, I'd made a decision, this had been the outcome, and so I connected my decision to the outcome. And then when we did interviews and got more background, we found in many cases were all these other things happening that had much greater uh, actual causation to what happened than my great or bad decision. And so I suddenly stepped back and said, I'm not even the star of my own memoirs. The reality is things are much more complex than that. And so the idea that the leader is the person that causes the corporation to be successful or the country to do it or the, or the team to win, whatever you, know, you want to connect it to, is usually a gross oversimplification. And it's partly the way we write history. It's also reinforced by things like our incentive programs. If someone leads an organization, they want to get credit, so they'll get promoted. Or if they're in a, uh, a financial thing, they want to get credit, so they'll be paid more. So there's a temptation to, to try to personify it, to say that's the reason we succeeded or didn't succeed. Now, I'm not trying to say that leaders are not important. They are. And other members of organizations are very important. But I think that when we try to attribute the outcomes to, to one or even a small number of people, we run a great risk of putting the spotlight on a single person ignoring everything that's right out of that field of view and missing the actual full story. And when we think about that further, and we talk about creating good organizations, we start to say, well, if we go get a great quarterback or a great coach, we've solved the problem. And actually, the organizations that do best build organizations. They build full teams, and they are then less reliant on the superstar CEO or something like that. So. I think it's, it's important we, we not 
you know, bow down or salute every time we pass somebody up on a pedestal. Thank you. Uh, in one of your TED Talks, um, you mentioned that leaders can let you fail without making you feel like a failure, uh, and that leaders increasingly need to adapt to environments and teams where they, they may not have expertise. And you mentioned this a little bit earlier in the complex environments. Uh, what advice do you have for MBA students who will still soon be leading diverse teams uh, with divergent skill sets uh, where they may not have expertise? Yeah, it's, uh, I'm going to take both of those because you mentioned the first part about you can fail without being a failure because that's really important because if we have a sense that we cannot fail without being a failure and, and the military, the army particularly, has a bad habit of zero defect uh, situations. If you get anything significant on your record, an officer or senior NCO is not likely to move to the next level of promotion or responsibility. What that does, it's insidious. You say, well, what we're going to do is we're going to call out the people who don't do well. What you do is you cause people to be extraordinarily risk averse because they don't want to take a chance where they could get a ding. And the problem with that, of course, is there are less dings, but there's also less accomplished because people are unwilling to take the kind of risks. And I'm not talking about being frivolous with people's lives. I'm talking about risks and in, in reasonable things that produce greater outcomes. The, the, the other part of that you talk about is you're going to go into organizations and you're not going to be the expert. Well, in some cases you will. In some cases you'll be a very narrow expert or you'll be the person most informed on a single issue. But as soon as you get more senior, that will become less and less the case. You may have more experience, more instinct, more general kind of ability to add to it, but you'll have less granular information. And I remember as I got more senior in the Army, another senior leader, I said, how do you get briefed 15 times a day? And someone comes in and briefs you on a pretty complicated thing. And you, how do you make a decision? Because there's no way you can understand all of the background information and the data the person puts in front of you for that decision. He said, well, what you learn to do is judge the briefer. You learn to judge whether that person speaking to you has credibility. If they have a track record, that's very useful. If they don't have a track record, you learn to get an instinct, instinctual response. Does that person seem to know? And really good leaders I've seen learn to ask some very strategic questions that sort of ferret out whether the person, one, understands what they're talking about, and two, as a rational. And it's still not foolproof because, as you know, people can come in and they can be very loquacious and convincing. And in, in the limits of senior leadership where you've got to go through decisions, you're, in many cases, you're a little bit uh, uh, vulnerable to that. But over time, you get better and better at it. So what I tell you is, particularly as you get senior, leadership and problem solving is more about people than it is about the nuts and bolts of the issue, particularly as you get the wide swaths of things. And you can't try to become an expert on all of those. And if you do, I think it's a fool's errand because you'll start to grab onto certain parts of it and you won't be able to step back and make, make the broader judgments that I, but I think are really the best way to go. Yeah, that's great. Um, building on that, maybe, um, leadership is often used synonymously with management. Um, you've, you've said a lot about both here today. Uh, how would you distinguish between the two? And what advice do you have for people who aspire to be good leaders uh, who are going into managerial positions? And how would you kind of delineate between those two? Yeah, I think that they are not easy to, to completely separate. Um, we tend to think of leadership as inspiration or developing of people. And we tend to think of management as, you know, assigning tasks and tracking things. In 1994, I was commanding a parachute infantry battalion in the 82nd Airborne Division. And on a March morning, I had paratroopers down at Pope Air Force Base preparing to do a practice parachute jump. And there was a freak accident above the airfield. An F-16 and a C-130 collided. They, they later attributed it to an air traffic control mistake. And in the process, the F-16 pilot ejected 
and the plane went down and crashed onto the airfield. Now it crashed onto the airfield and it hit a parked airplane, a cargo plane, a C-141, that was loaded with fuel, but not with people. And it created a fireball of fuel and wreckage. And that fireball of fuel and wreckage went about 100 more meters and ran right into where elements of my battalion and another battalion were preparing for a parachute jump. So in an instant, young paratroopers were engulfed in flame and wreckage. 21 were killed, 45 were badly injured, in many cases, burns, amputations, and whatnot. Now, over the next, really, months, but really over the next days right after that, I was a leader who had just had 10% of my battalion made casualties. And you expect casualties in wartime, but this was in peacetime. And then just in an instant, 10% of the battalion were casualties of a pretty shocking nature. Now, I had to try to be the best leader I could be and provide inspiration and interact with people. But the other thing I had to do was be a manager. Because in that moment, we had to organize our battalion to provide people to take care of families. In many cases, there were families that, that had been left by someone who killed or wounded. Other families came in, parents and whatnot, to, to take care of people. We had to arrange meals, hotel rooms, travel. And then fairly soon, we had to arrange burial parties that go around the country and conduct the burials. Now, in that case, you could say that that second part was logistics and it was management. But I'd say it's pretty hard to parse out that management from leadership because it was so incredibly important. So what I'd say is good leaders have got to be competent managers so people get paid, so people get health care. So in the case of soldiers, so they get fed, so that the mess all things that seem mundane but at the end of the day or the welfare of people, I think it, it overlaps into leadership. And so I think that's true at, at every level. And so I would say that we don't want to, to prevent, pretend that there is more separation than there is. At the same time, I think if someone is skewed totally towards management and they don't understand that the other human aspects of leadership, they're unlikely to be as effective in critical moments as, as they might be. We've all known people who, who that is their greater strength. Got it. Uh, in, in leaders, you mentioned uh, lessons you learned from the, the leader of Al Qaeda in Iraq. Um, can you expand on some of those lessons and uh, why did you choose specifically to focus on Zarqawi? Yeah, Abu Musab al Zarqawi was a young Jordanian who'd grown up in the town of Zarqa, an industrial town. And he had, as a young man, gotten more, well, first, he had a lot of issues, petty crime. He was kind of a thug, got into drugs and alcohol. And his mother put him in a more fundamentalist school. And then he became more imbued with, with the tenets of Islam. And then he went to, first to Pakistan, then Afghanistan, to try to fight the Soviets. But he got there after the Soviets had, had pulled out of Afghanistan. So he did operate against the the remnants of the Soviet-backed government under President Najibullah. But he became more and more extreme. He came back to Jordan a few years later and got himself thrown into prison by the Jordanians who considered him a dangerous extremist. And he spent five years in prison. And during that period, he became more and more extreme, more and more committed, more and more fanatical, we would say, or zealous. He came out of there, went back, and formed an organization that was allied with, but initially not part of Al-Qaeda. And I tell you this story because he took a road to get to lead an organization that eventually became known as Al-Qaeda in Iraq. He was not particularly well, or in fact, he was not well educated at all. But he was extraordinarily committed. He was uh, inflexibly committed to his beliefs. And that's not always a bad thing. I mean, there's a, you know, there's a reason to admire someone who believes in something strongly. Now, I believed in something different. But the reality was he had a level of zealotry that was very inspirational to people to bring to him. And he committed people to a level of extremism against the, uh, the government of Iraq and against American and allied forces 
because he was so committed to it. And he was also a very effective retail leader. He dealt well with people. He was kind of soft-spoken around those. He did the things that people expected a terrorist leader to do. He dressed the party, went out and, and did operational things. So I say all of this is while I very much was opposed to him, I thought he was a psychopathic murderer, I also thought he was a very effective leader. And for two and a half years, my force fought him and we ultimately killed him. But the fact that I thought so different from him shouldn't color my admission that he was damn good. And he almost beat us. And he almost beat us because he was very good, not because his cause or whatever. And so I say that. And so he, he had a, a uh, leadership style that was fairly decentralized. It was very flexible, constantly adaptable. You know, a lot of things. He probably couldn't walk into a Fortune 500 company because he had some other issues, but the reality is he was, he was good. And, and we have got to learn from people who are effective, not just people we like or agree with. One last question for you, General. Yes, sir. Uh, when I served on active duty, I spent a career in a joint service environment uh, where it was rare to know the political affiliation of other ser uh, service members. Um, however, political conversations uh, took a turn uh, later in my career. And uh, before I separated from the Air Force in 2016, I noticed a culture shift across the organizations that uh, embraced over tribal politics. Um, I'm interested to hear your perspective on how leaders should manage fast, move, fast moving, corrosive culture shifts. Yeah, this is gonna be something that we're gonna have to learn to do because my experience was yours. When I was in the military, we didn't talk politics of a partisan nature. I didn't know who was a Republican, Democrat, or whatever. It just wasn't considered the right thing to do. And yet, as we see this growth in this cultural or tribal politics, it's almost identifying with a part of our society as opposed to a traditional political party. It's pretty dangerous. And it's fueled by, in many cases, by misinformation or disinformation. I think that the first thing we've got to do in the military is we've got to stay absolutely focused with people, the importance of an apolitical military. And the importance is because if we lose that nature of our military, we will be like many other countries that have had military overthrows on a pretty regular basis because the military starts to rationalize that they are the actual stewards of the nation. And so they, they will overthrow a civilian government and say, we actually have the best uh, interests of the people at heart, and we know best. And I, and I think in many cases, they actually believe that. But once you create that dynamic and the military, who are uniquely armed, and therefore it's a, it's, you know, they are advantaged in a competitive, competitive environment, um, then suddenly you don't have a democracy. You have something different. You have something that's been corrupted. I think that we've got to start by constantly pushing, not just to inside our military force, but outside the importance of an apolitical military. The second is discipline. There are certain things you just don't do because you're in the military. And if you choose to be in the military, there are, you follow orders, you don't do other things. And so the reality is I think we've got to understand that military people are not like every other citizen because we give them weapons. And so the reality is when a person joins the military, they make a vow that they are going to follow certain orders and, and not become partisan. I think we need to nail that as well. And then we need to have a discussion across uh, our nation that once our political conversation, discussion, argument, whatever we want to call it, once it starts to tip past a certain point, it's really hard to get back. I've been doing a lot of reading about the, the decades before the US Civil War recently. And the reality is there was a period for several decades where there was always disagreements between the North and the South political party and even over slavery. But then it tipped 
And it started to tip about 1850, and then of course the publication of Uncle Tom's Cabin. And then it became a cultural disagreement, not just a political disagreement. There was always that in the background and in economic issues, but then it became tribal. And once it became tribal, arguably, it may have been impossible to stop the, the carnage that, that began in 1861. And that's what we don't want to see, in, in my view. Thank you, General. Call me Stan, please. Come on, guys. We talked about that. <laughs> I've been well, called a lot worse, so don't worry. You know. <laughs> OK, Stan, uh, if I may. Um, please. Thank you. So we have time for questions from the audience. Um, and this is a wonderful opportunity. So if any of you would like to go to the mics and ask a question of General Stan, um, please do so. And can you please identify yourselves also? Hi, Stan. My name is Peter. I'm a full-time MBA. Thank you so much for being here with us. So here at Berkeley Haas, one of the core tenets of our school is to learn how to challenge the status quo. So you mentioned that in the military, you have to follow orders from your commanding officer. It's not really much of a dialogue. Um, you just do what he or she tells you. So how do you reconcile that with becoming an independent thinker um, who um, uses your autonomy to make um, important decisions? Yeah, it's a great question. And there's a tension in the military, it always has been. You want a kind of classic thinkers who will question doctrine, who will question uh, processes in the military, who will, who will push the bounds of the way things are done. Look at Billy Mitchell with air power. And, and there are always history like that. However, there is a time for that and a way to do that. And then there's a time not to do that. As I tell people, you know, when the landing craft hits Omaha Beach and the, the ramp drops, that's not the time for people to question whether this is a good idea. That is the time when you follow through and execute. It's a little bit of art. I mean, people have got to understand there is a time in a warm, cool, dry, calm place where you can push things and you can have that conversation, even with your very senior leaders. There's not a time for, um, the kind of character attacks or arguments that weaken the institution that aren't a conversation. Uh, many of you, and, and I doubt many of you are married at this point, but if you are, you know that a marriage consists of a number of conversations. And those conversations have got to be conducted carefully within a certain rule set. Because once you cross by, cross outside too often and too far, it's hard to resurrect it. And so I would say, that's kind of the way it is in the military. Unfortunately, we too often become too rank conscious, too status quo conscious, too limited. And so I think we can push the bounds courteously, respectfully, a little more than we do. Hi, sir. My name is Emma Levy, and I'm a second year MBA. Uh, I was an analyst at the McChrystal Group back in 2013. Um, it was my first job out of college and remains a really foundational part of my career. And I know well, the McChrystal Group. Thanks for all you've done. <laughs> Good to see you again. <laughs> um, so I know the McChrystal Group has changed and evolved since I was there in um, 2013. I left in 2014 to go back to grad school. Um, but I was wondering if you could share an example for how the application of your leadership principles has um, transformed corporations. Yeah, and that's a really good question. Again, thanks for all you've done. What we do is we try to, to partner with organizations basically to unlock their capacity. You know, most organizations have got pretty good people. They've got, they're in a good market. Or if they're not, those are problems that, that we really can't take on for them. They've got to... They've got to have certain things. But what we can do is we can unlock their ability. So what we found is there are several things that work pretty well. First is to understand the problem and do a, a diagnostic to get out and see why the engine's running rough. Mm -hmm. The second is to get an operating rhythm that works. That seems, that seems so basic. It's really a schedule. It's how you do things. You, you control interactions. And people say, well, that's basic. That's simple stuff. It's actually not. 
creating an effective operating rhythm that creates processes and passes information on a constant basis is key. Creating decision space, identifying what decisions are made where, and it's not uh, inflexible, but it creates the ability for decisions. And the heart of it, of course, is communication. At the end of the day, I would say that the most important thing that organizations seek is what we call shared consciousness. And that is a common contextual understanding of what the organization's trying to do and what the situation is in the moment. And therefore, people are empowered to make decisions down at a lower level because they're now armed with information and not just authorities, but expectations that they make decisions closer to the problem. And we found tremendous success as organizations do this. And again, it sounds basic, but it's really easy to say, and as you know, really hard to do. A little bit like you know, doing a nuclear reaction. You bring a bunch of things together and think it's gonna work, where you can have a really bad outcome or you can produce great energy. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. Um, my question is in regards to your involvement in Afghanistan. Um, from what I understand, you played a significant role back in 2009 in pushing for tens of thousands of more troops to be sent to Afghanistan as part of a counterinsurgency strategy, and basically to give time to the U.S. to train and build a larger Afghan national army and police force. And in a meeting with Biden, you along with Petraeus and others were asked, quote, if the government's a criminal syndicate a year from now, how will the troops make a difference? Quote, if a year from now there is no demonstrable progress in governments, what do we do? And according to Woodward's Obama's wars, uh, no one in that room recorded an answer in their notes. Uh, you later admitted in an interview last year that, quote, I don't think we sat around a table ever and talked about where this is going to be in 20 years. Uh, it's documented extensively how leading U.S. generals and officials have lied profusely regarding the wars following 9-11 and the quote-unquote progress that they were making and none of them have been punished yet for their deceit. You've, of course, continued on in building a career after your time in the military, and as we know, Afghanistan is now in complete shambles. There are nearly 20 million people on the verge of famine, millions of others that are now refugees, hundreds of thousands of civilians killed, and thousands of our own troops dead as well, all for the price of over $2 trillion. I don't know what it's like serving the military. I don't know what it's like being in a position of authority where you need to make decisions with limited information. But what I do know is that when people are put into extremely high positions of power, they deserve greater scrutiny as well. And so my two-part question is, one, do you believe you share any responsibility, an iota of accountability in the current humanitarian crisis, the largest of its kind right now in Afghanistan? And two, what is the U.S. military and the U.S. government's responsibility in uplifting a people whose country that we help destroy? I'm not sure you, what you want my response to be here. I mean, that, that was more speech than question. Uh, I, have a, I have a different view. I believe, and I will tell you what I saw. I saw from 2002 on, which is the first time I actually went to Afghanistan, I saw uh, forces from the West, the United States being the preponderance, go there and find a country that was literally uh, in tatters from almost 20 years of war at that point, as you remember, 10 years of war against the Soviets, and then a brutal civil war, and first amongst the Muj groups, and then with the Taliban. So when we arrived in 2002, there was a, uh, a requirement in Afghanistan for the Afghans to put back a nation, put it together, and yet the pieces were in pretty bad shape. So you run into a pretty difficult situation. There was an argument that says we should have turned our backs and walked away at that point. And that's not the decisions that were made. And, and I personally think that that would have been a very difficult decision to make. The actions that I saw after that every year, and I was, I was there part of every year from 2002 until I left the service in 2010. I never saw the, the version that, that some of your question described. Uh, I never saw stupid people. I never saw people lying about the situation. I never saw the kinds of things that you, you either believe or, or the tone of the question. What I saw was good people 
working hard, trying to get a good outcome. Now, we didn't get a good outcome, which ought to give us an awful lot of cause, because if we do have good people trying very hard to get a good outcome, and we don't get the outcome we want, that's actually more disturbing than if we can find some generals who lied or, or something like that, because in reality, if we do our, give it our best shot and we struggle, then, uh, then I think we gotta look at a whole bunch of things, processes and whatnot. You asked the question whether I feel responsible. Of course I do. I believe, well, let me put it this way. I only know what my intentions were and my decisions were. And I'm very comfortable with what my intentions were. I don't think all my decisions were right. I don't think there'll be many senior leaders who claim that every decision they made was right. But the reality is, I think that as I look at the decisions of others as well, I think there was a, a, uh, a good faith effort, a lot of, again, a lot of mistakes made, but I think that you probably oversimplify it, in, in my interpretation, in, in the way that you, uh, you've concluded. And as we go into a situation like this again, what we've got to do is be able to step back and say, okay, how are we going to get better next time? One, morally, will we make the decision to do anything? Will we just say, well, we touched the stove and it was too hot, and therefore we can't do that? And I would point to things like Rwanda where we made the decision to do nothing. And, and there's certainly uh, questions about whether we would do that particular decision again. But, but this is what's going to make it hard. And that's why I think studying this kind of thing is of value for you. Thank you so much, Thank you. General. Thank you. Can you please I identify yourself? Hi, my name is Austin Levin, full-time MBA class of 2022. That's going to be a tough act to follow. My question's a little easier. Um, so prior to Haas, I worked for the Intel community and served as a consultant for the IC. In my time in the IC, I learned that faith in democratic institutions are really key to a country's stability. My question for you is, how do we get faith in democratic institutions in the states back on track, given the fact that right now the faith is at an all-time low, given like corrosive political commentary? Yeah. Um, I agree with you completely that the most important thing is to have faith in our democratic institutions to include elections. I think they've been undermined by misinformation, disinformation, and also by some people who have conducted themselves in a way that I think gives us a big question mark in whether uh, our, our uh, institutions are as strong and provide as fair an outcome as they need to. The problem is now, even if they do provide that, there's enough people who doubt it that, that it gets a certain reality in perception. And if people doubt that the outcome, in fact, is either real or you know, reflects the will of the people, then you suddenly are unfettered. You can make an argument that says, if the election was not fair, then why should I limit my actions to those things within the law? Why wouldn't I use violence or other things to overthrow the government? Because the, the foundation upon which the, the legitimacy of the government, which is the validity of elections, is in doubt. That's why this is so incredibly important, so incredibly sacred. And yet we are trying to figure out in this new environment of the way information flows and whatnot, how to deal with it. And I'm not sure that we, I don't think we're mature enough yet as a society for the information technology we have at our fingertips. I think we've got more power than we have maturity to, to use it because we can, as we know, we can influence people in ways that are pretty dangerous. Thank you. Hi, I'm George. I work for the Department of Energy, so I'm intimately familiar with the command and control structure and the zero defect policies you describe. Also, I'm forbidden to make a third rack comparisons at work, but you started that uh, in the beginning with, you know, Adolf Hitler was a very uh, efficient leader, so thank you for that. I'm going <laughs> to bring that to work. But to my question, if you have an organization that is very command and control, how did you manage to get the decisions down to the people and how did you, I guess, manage up and like stand behind uh, 
a shift in organizational uh, structure there? Yeah, um, well, imperfectly would be the answer, but the, the reality is the military is perceived as the ultimate command and control organization. The ranks are clear, the chain of command, and everybody thinks that if a leader and a military leader tells the organization to go left, it all goes left. That's not really accurate. The reality is it's much more like a civilian organization. On the parade ground, privates will follow a sergeant because that's an environment and they're certainly frightened of the sergeant there. But in combat, they're more frightened of the enemy. And so the reality is they do things for leaders in difficult environments and particularly when you are spread out. So the leadership that is needed to be effective in that situation is much more the influence kind of leadership and inspiration and them trusting that the, the decisions made by their leaders are in the best interests of them, that individual soldier, but also of the, uh, the cause for which they fight. The, there's always institutional pressures on organizations if you try to change as We tried to change at the counterterrorist world. When we pushed things a certain way, there would be almost an equal and opposite reaction that says, no, you can't do them that way because we've not done it that way before. Um, I found in some cases, you've got to make the argument to senior leaders. And you got to go up and say, this is what we have to do. And I had a fair amount of success because the moment that, that was most difficult, and that was the Iraq years from 2003 to 2008, people felt like it was very necessary to do something different. So I think we got additional leeway to do things that we probably wouldn't have gotten in a peacetime environment. It just, the bureaucracy sort of closes in on you. And then there are times when you've just got to act. There are times when you have got to act and seek forgiveness. And that doesn't mean you are trying to be disloyal or trying to, to violate things. That just means there are times you've got to push the boundaries because if, every, uh, if everybody waits and asks detailed instructions for everything they do, that will cause an organization to seize up just as badly as the leader. So it's not just a, a micromanaging leader that can be the problem. It can be a lack of uh, willingness on the part of people down in the organization to push and accept responsibility and in some cases put themselves a little bit at risk to do that. And a lot of the organizations we deal with today, what leaders will tell us is they are most frustrated by the decisions their subordinates won't make. You know, we talk about risk and whatnot, and they say, I keep telling my subordinates to take more risk. And of course, that's a trust issue, but, but, but I think it goes both ways. And so junior people at times have got to be willing to push that. All right, thank you. Hello, my name is Danny M. I'm a current senior uh, studying electrical engineering here in the undergraduate program here at Berkeley. I'm also an Army ROTC cadet, and I actually had a question. Uh, with our Army currently rapidly changing and our society and country as a whole rapidly getting polarized, I was just wondering, you know, you were in the same shoes as me one time, and I was wondering if you had any advice for junior officers or, you know, senior yeah. lieutenants. Sure. I think the, the age I came out in 19, I went into West Point in 1972. It was a pretty polarized period. The 60s were, were pretty difficult. Uh, 72, the Army was in a pretty difficult way. It was coming out of Vietnam and not coming out in a healthy way. And so I graduated from West Point in 76. Things had gotten a little bit better. But I will tell you that my experience was it starts at home. And when I say at home, it starts with the individual. The most important thing I think each of us can do is sort of figure out who we are and what our values are. You're going to be pressured in many ways, not always intentionally and not evilly, but organizations, your friends, society, everything is going to push you in multiple directions and you're going to have to decide who you are. There's an extraordinarily good article, uh, The World of Epictetus, written by James Stockdale, which describes his time in the Hanoi Hilton. And of course, in an era when for five years he loses all control over his physical life, he's tortured, he's abused, he can do he can make no decisions that we would take for granted on a daily basis. What he learns is 
What he can hold on to is his values, the identity that he sees for himself, his personal narrative. And I think many of us uh, don't spend enough time on that trying to do that. Now, that doesn't mean that I think at a young age, everyone should know exactly who you are and everything you believe in, and therefore you become inflexible for the rest of your life. I think you will, like all of us, you'll mature and grow. But I think paying attention to that, understanding the importance of that journey, the, I think the most important things in my life, besides some of the key relationships that I value heavily, are the idea that I want to be somebody that I can look in the mirror and feel comfortable with. I want my granddaughters to be able to look at me or read about me and have some sense that I was somebody that they could be comfortable about and proud of. And whatever a person's uh, metrics for that are, that's what I tell you. It's more important than learning how to fire and maneuver as a lieutenant. You get that part right and everything else gets easier. Roger, thank you, sir. Thank you. Good luck. Hi, Stan. My name is Rohan. I'm a third year at the undergraduate Haas program. Um, I was sort of wondering, you know, I've been hearing a lot in the media, both on both sides of the aisle, that people are sort of very bearish about America right now. What is sort of one contrarian argument that you have in the case that you're sort of very optimistic about America? What's sort of one reason in that respect? Well, if, if I'm optimistic about America, it's going to be because generations have come up. And this is, sounds like a trite answer, but America is, our history is interesting, but it doesn't define who we are because that's history. It's not the reality anymore. The reality is who we are now and who we decided to be going forward. So if there is reason for optimism, it's in the room with you now. It's in other rooms like this. It's in young people who make a decision on what they're going to do. And in some cases, people my age make a decision on what values we're going to support. You know, too often we say we're exceptional. America is an exceptional country. I, I don't think so. America is a country. It's exceptional if we get up this morning and act exceptional. And if we get up tomorrow morning and we don't act exceptionally, we're not exceptional anymore. There's nothing, there's no greater being that came down and touched America and said we're better than everybody else. You know, there's nobody who says our values are better or our economy's better. It's only if we do that work and we embody those, uh, those behaviors. On the one hand, that's kind of disappointing. You say, well, we've had 200 plus years of people working hard to create this great thing that we've inherited. No, actually, they got us into the room and now it's all up to us. And so what I'd say is that's the opportunity. The bad things we've got to understand, but it's up to us. It's what we do now. It's what we do going forward. It's not what's in the rearview mirror that I think is going to make a difference. And I think there's every reason in the world that America can do very, very well. And we're going to have to because we are entering into the equivalent of a Cold War competition, whether we want to or not. I think it's just going to come upon us. And so we're going to have to, not militarily only, but as a society, we're going to have to be a society that other people admire. Because ultimately, if they don't admire us as a society, they won't support us in the world. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, General McChrystal. You have given us so much food for thought. You've been inspiring. You've been honest. You've been empathetic. You've been humble, um, really insightful. We're very grateful to you for this opportunity. We're very grateful to our Veterans Club at Haas for making this opportunity possible. So thank you, and thank everyone in the room. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you.